What's going on, Packer fans? Welcome back to the Pack a Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. Before I forget, if you are listening today, that means it is Tuesday. That means tonight, 7 p.m. Central, right here, Pack a Day podcast, live on YouTube with special guests Ben Fennel and Aaron Nagler. Will be an absolute can't miss episode. Certainly wish we had a fun victory over the Vikings to talk about, but. Uh, anytime you get a chance to listen to Ben break down tape and break down exactly what happened, it is can't miss. And of course, Aaron, extremely knowledgeable as well. It is going to be a very, very fun discussion that I am extremely looking forward to and you will not want to miss. So make sure to check that out 7 p.m. live here on YouTube, right on the Pack a Day podcast channel. All right, let's get into some news and notes, first of all, from Monday. And while Sunday was pretty darn abysmal, Monday actually brought some good news, which was much needed after a pretty crappy Sunday. Um, And the first piece was uh, reported by Tom Silverstein and then uh, confirmed by Matt LaFleur in his press conference. And that is the fact that Chris Barnes did not suffer a season-ending injury. Most times when you get an air cast in a cart, that pretty much is game, set, match. But sounds like it was more of a high ankle sprain. He will be out for some period of time, but it is not a season-ending injury. Sounds like he could be back maybe in a month or two. So a massive sigh of relief for Chris Barnes, who had a pretty nice game actually, and not just in relief of Quay Walker. Uh, If you didn't notice, they played him. uh, They actually played some 4-3 sets. They definitely played three linebacker sets uh, with Barnes, Walker, and Campbell. They did a lot of interesting stuff. So Barnes has a legitimate role on this team. I thought he looked good, and you certainly love love to see that he's going to be back uh, at least at some point this season, and it's not a season-ending injury for him. The other piece of good news, same position, Quay Walker. Sounds like he will have an opportunity to play this Sunday, no guarantees. Uh, Matt LaFleur said they'll give him through the week, but it does seemingly feel like they're optimistic about maybe his chances of playing. So that is huge news as well. So hopefully they will get some reinforcements along the inside linebacker position, although I thought Isaiah McDuffie, uh, stepped up when asked upon at the end of that game. It was garbage time by that point, but still played well when he got in. And of course, you still have Devondre Campbell as well. So not extremely thin. They, they'll they you know potentially still call up Ray Wilborn uh, as a possibility, either as a call up or as a active roster addition if they do in fact put Chris Barnes on IR with the potential to return later. Uh, so we'll have to keep an eye on that still. But uh, inside linebacker looks much better today than it did on Sunday. Uh, as far as the other injuries, uh, John Runyon Jr. will have to go through concussion protocol, so we'll have to keep an eye on that. And Keyshawn Nixon, there was no injury update provided there. So that's the injury update that we know, but still very, very good news with both Barnes and Walker. All right, so what I want to do today is, and what I'll probably do on most Tuesday episodes, if, assuming it's a Sunday game, is sort of do a upon further review type episode. And at this point, I've been able to watch the game, rewatch the game, and then watch both the offense and defense on the all 22 version. Every player, every play, I've finished my grades already. I'll go through all my grades tomorrow, but I wanted today to be more of a focus on sort of my big takeaways. And it's really such an amazing exercise to go through because you have your gut reactions when you're watching the game, right? And just certain things that you feel in your gut of like, this was awful, this was good, this was bad, etc. And then you you go through the the TV tape rewatch, and you you're still you know sort of probably influenced a little bit from your initial watch, but you start to get a little bit more of a feel for it. And sometimes, and a lot of times, you know when you feel really good about a game, you can rewatch it on that initial rewatch and be like, okay, maybe it wasn't quite as good. Same thing on the reverse. Sometimes you rewatch and you're like, all right, it really wasn't that bad. When I rewatch the game. I still felt pretty darn bad about the game on my initial rewatch. And then then you get to go through the All-22, and that is the tape that absolutely does not lie. And there was some good, there was some bad. I felt slightly better about the game on the All-22 than I did on the TV copy, more on the defensive end. And I, I mentioned yesterday, I actually felt better about the defense than I think the vast majority of people did. It wasn't great. Um, Certainly a lot of things that they'll need to clean up, which we'll go over here in just a moment. Uh, But there was a lot of good on defense as well, which we'll also talk about. So felt a little bit better about the defense, 
felt still very crappy about the offense as I've rewatched everything. So here were my main takeaways after watch, rewatch, and now all 22 on both sides. So the first thing, and Matt LaFleur mentioned this as well, and I had not completed the all 22 uh, by the time Matt LaFleur was doing his press conference, uh, but he had said in his presser that you know the, he thought the effort was good throughout the game. And my initial thought was, really? Uh, but as I rewatched this, I, I thought there was still effort issues on offense, especially once they got down 17 nothing. So I don't totally agree with that. But I thought on the defensive side of the ball and on special teams, I did think that they really finished the game and, and played that through and didn't give up, specifically Kenny Clark, who we'll talk about a lot tomorrow in the grading the pack session. But uh, I, I thought overall they, they didn't quit on this game and I thought they were still battling until the end, especially again on defense. Offense, not always. I thought there was a lot of, you know, you, you could just tell there was no rhythm. And then maybe that was the bigger thing that there was no rhythm and that caused what maybe looked like lack of energy. But overall, I, I, I especially thought on defense that there was not a lack of energy. And again, I thought on special teams too, for the most part, they finished out that game. Let's, let's talk more about Justin Jefferson too, because a couple things here. As I rewatched Justin Jefferson, I do think that they tried more you know, defenses and, and different things on him than it looked like at first glance. I think it's easy to forget sometimes that while there were the, you know, massive completions to Jefferson, which are unacceptable, I'm not sugarcoating any of this at all. Um, but you also have to remember there were quite a few plays in the game where Justin Jefferson wasn't targeted and some of the things that they did in those situations worked and they did have Jair on him on a couple plays. And there were some other things that they did that worked as well. However, it clearly was not good enough. So what were the big takeaways from that? The first, and this is not, again, a sugarcoating or excuse, but Justin Jefferson is insanely freaking good. And it's not like Green Bay didn't know that going in. It's not like we didn't know that going in. But my goodness, he played phenomenal in that game. And I certainly do not envy anyone that has to go up against him through the course of the game. His movements, his route running, his speed, his agility, his athleticism, it's all on display all game long. And there were certainly some just tip your cap moments, not an excuse, not a, um, you know, not saying, not giving Green Bay a pass on that at all. But you do have some tip your cap moments to say, yeah, he's just a really good football player. Think of Devontae Adams, right? There were times where defenses had him covered perfectly and it just didn't matter, right? Because he was Devontae freaking Adams. We're at that point with Justin Jefferson. Now, the bigger thing is I thought there was a lack of communication in far too many instances on defense. There were some cover four issues where they did not pass along players or, or travel with players when needed. And those are things where it's impossible to know what their rules are in those specific situations. For example, there's the play where he goes wide open on the deep ball and or on the deep crosser, right? And Jair Alexander and Razul Douglas, they both got players that they're crossing or that are crossing the field. And Razul clearly thought that he was supposed to stay with his man. And Jair thought clearly that they were going to switch and that Razul was going to fade off and go with, uh, with Jefferson and that Jair would fade off and go with Razul's man. They weren't on the same page. Whose fault that was? Impossible for me to know. Um, I can't grade specifically on whose fault that is. That to me is a communication breakdown, whether that's from coaching to what they're expecting of the players, whether that's them communicating on the field, or it's just a mental break. It's, it could just be a mental breakdown by one of the players and one of the players just biffed it. That's possible too. But that happened far too often in the game where there are rules in place for how you're supposed to defend those type of situations when you're in a zone or a zone match defense. And Green Bay fell apart far too often. When you're seeing Justin Jefferson run wide open, it's not because a player just does like, ah, we don't need to cover him, right? There was a there was a breakdown, either a mental breakdown or a communication breakdown. And when it came to Justin Jefferson, those were the two things that I saw the most. A, he's a phenomenal player. And B, there were far too many 
you know, coverage breakdowns, communication breakdowns, whatever you want to call it, those things just simply can't happen. So that was my my Justin Jefferson takeaways. There was you still need to have a better plan for him, and we'll talk about that more in just a second. But uh, I did think Minnesota did some really good things in Green Bay's communication and how they're handling those situations. Just clearly, flat out, was not good enough. As far as the offense goes, I felt better, a little bit better, a smidge better about the weapons in this game. When I initial, you know, on my initial watch, and again, it's really hard to see down the field, right? In the, the TV copy, there's only certain things you can see on certain plays. Um, on my initial watch, I just felt like it, it, it seemed like nobody was ever getting open and there was a, a major issue and it, it's just going to be a grind all season to, to try to get open with the weapons that they have. I didn't see that quite as much. I, it was still not good enough. I'll start by saying that. And they desperately need playmakers with the ball in their hands. And we saw a little bit from Dylan. We certainly saw some from Jones. We saw the ability from Watson, even though it didn't come to fruition, but we we need to see more playmaking ability. But I did think there were times where receivers, tight ends, running backs, et cetera, got, no, got open. And it, you know, the, either the protection wasn't there, Rogers didn't see it, Rogers didn't pull the trigger, whatever the case may be. But I do think it wasn't quite as bad from a weapon standpoint as I initially thought on my initial watch. I thought Sammy Watkins played a little bit better. Uh, you know, besides the huge drop, I thought Christian Watson had a couple plays here and there where maybe Rodgers could have taken a shot down the field. Um, and I thought Romeo Dobbs had a few plays as well. I thought Randall Cobb actually uncovered multiple times and found holes in zones. And unfortunately, you know, Rodgers just couldn't find him. So I, I thought it was slightly better from a weapons standpoint. Still not good enough. Still have some concern. We'll see what happens when Alan Lazard comes back. But on the flip side, I thought the offensive line, and we knew Jake Hansen struggled, right? That was a very clear and obvious uh, distinction when we watched it the first time through. I thought this offensive line was abysmal, and I mean abysmal. And I, you know, really from from left to right, Josh Myers had an okay game. I know Matt, Matt Lafleur, and trust me, trust Matt Lafleur over me. Matt Lafleur said, you know, Josh Myers had a pretty good game. I, I'm okay with that. I, I had a slight, slight negative grade, basically a neutral grade on Josh Myers. I thought he had an okay, solid game, average game, whatever you want to call it. Wasn't bad. Certainly was not bad. Um, PFF had a slightly lower grade on him, but either way, trust Matt Lafleur on that one. Um, Everyone else, and I, the other day I, or I, I said Yash had an okay game or a good game. I, I didn't think so. In hindsight, that's actually probably the, the biggest thing that PFF and I disagreed with from an offensive standpoint. They had a solid grade on Yash. I thought he did not play well enough, quite frankly. I thought John Runyon Jr. had a rough game. I thought, uh, you know, Jake Hansen was really, really bad. I had actually a worse grade on Royce Newman. I thought he really struggled as well. And it was it just all across the board was not good enough. And that goes to coaching, that goes to depth, that goes to players. And clearly it's really tough to lose, you know, not have, I should say, Bakhtiari and Elton Jenkins. That's going to clearly change the, the calculus across the offensive line of just how good you can be. And then you lose John Running Jr., who was their best offensive lineman based on consistency a season ago. Jenkins and Bakhtiari, clearly the better players, but they were out a good chunk of the year. So on the whole, John Running Jr. was the best offensive lineman a season ago. He goes out midway through the game, even though he was struggling in the game prior to that. So really tough to, to overcome that, but it was, it was really, really bad. And while I thought Aaron Rodgers really struggled in this game, I'm certainly willing to give him a bit more accident forgiveness when he has years of MVP play and the offensive line was just constantly and consistently breaking down all around him. That'll make your eyes drop a little bit. And when you are not familiar with exactly what your receivers are going to do, I mean, he had a connection with Devontae Adams that you know he probably could have thrown with his eyes closed on certain plays and knew exactly where to go with the ball, but just based on their chemistry, right? He has a little bit of that with Randall Cobb, but never to the extent that he had with Jordy or that he had with Devontae Adams. And Sammy Watkins, Romeo Dobbs, Christian Watson, the other receivers in this game, Juwan Winfrey, it's gonna take a, it's gonna take time to get that rhythm down. And it's just not there right now. So when you're not fully trusting and believing in what your receivers are doing around you, and your offensive line is constantly breaking down at almost all times from all angles, 
Yeah, that's going to give you a pretty big uncomfortable feeling as a quarterback. Now, Rodgers held the ball too long at times. A lot of the, a couple of the sacks were on him and not the offensive line. Uh, the, the wide receivers need to do a better job of separating sooner. And, and just, again, the offensive line needs to do a lot better job. They didn't. And that's the biggest takeaway that I have from offense. Could the game plan have been better? Yes. Could you probably get more touches for Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon? Yes. But uh, I thought the offensive line set them up for failure all the way around. And there was just no overcoming it, unfortunately. So that was a huge takeaway there. Um, I thought the wide receivers blocked really well. That's, I think, a hopefully a positive takeaway moving forward. I thought Cobb blocked well. I thought Watson blocked really well. Uh, I thought Sammy Watkins blocked really well. Uh, not so much for Romeo Dobbs, but I saw a little bit more effort from him. So I, I thought that was a positive takeaway. And while I think all of us were hoping for Zach Tom instead of Jake Hansen or Royce Newman, Zach Tom really struggled when he got into. Now, to be fair to him, he's coming in in a terrible situation, down three scores, and trying to fight back in the game, throwing the ball a ton, coming in cold, going against a defense that can tee off on Aaron Rodgers. That's a tough situation to come in in your very first game in as a rookie on the road, loud environment, not a great setup, right? So I'm not willing to say that, you know, he couldn't have maybe played better than Jake Hansen or Royce Newman in that game had he had the opportunity to start the game and maybe get in rhythm. But he came in and he really struggled as well. There were a couple of nice blocks, a couple, couple positives to take away, uh, but he he struggled. There were certainly some run plays where he didn't hold up at the point of attack, a couple of pressures that he allowed. So, you know, it's not as simple as just saying like, hey, just put in Zach Tom at right guard for Jake Hansen and, you know, you can wipe your hands. Even if that were the case, even if that fixes one of them, one of the problems, Royce Newman really struggled, Yash struggled, Runyon struggled, and Myers was just okay. So like they're going to have to clean that up and clearly getting Bakhtiari and, and Jenkins back will help a lot, but you know, we'll see what condition those guys are in and when, if, and when Bakhtiari can play and when, uh, when Jenkins can play, I'm sure they're both going to be good once they're healthy, but we're going to have to see once that happens as well. Right now, the offensive line is a mess and that was a, a really big takeaway. And again, I don't think Zach Tom's just this easy plug and play solution that maybe we were hoping for at one point. Overall, I would say the offense has a lot more of the blame than the defense in this game. I know the defense didn't play up to expectations, and I know there was some expectation that the offense was going to take some time to get off the ground, but I thought the offense was way worse than the defense was in this game, especially again after rewatching. And overall, um, maybe the biggest thing I can tell you, this defense, I fully believe after rewatching, is going to be just fine. There was nothing from a talent standpoint. There was nothing from an intensity standpoint. There was nothing from anything like that that would give me reason or pause to say like, hey, this, maybe this defense isn't as good as we thought. They have to clear up some of the communication. They have to get some of their zone rules down, and they will clean that up this week and be much better against the Bears. I'm very uh, confident in that. I thought there were a lot of positive takeaways on the defense. A completely inexplicable game from Adrian Namus, who had clearly his worst game as a Green Bay Packer, and um, you know some some weird coverage breakdowns that they will clean up. But that's an easy cleanup. That's just communication and making sure that everyone knows the rules and exactly what they're supposed to be doing. They get that down, and this is going to be a very intense, very fast, very physical defense. And Rashawn Gary will get better as the season goes along, and and you know I think they'll increase their pressure as well. Remember, they didn't get an opportunity to really work in any of their pressure defenses either. So I'm very bullish on this defense, even though I think they didn't play up to what we were all hoping for in that first game against Minnesota. All right, last big thing here is that while I felt maybe a little bit better about certain things after the rewatch and maybe the energy was better than I, I thought at first glance, I still thought there were far too many coaching deficiencies in this game. I still go back to you had all off season, Justin Jefferson tore you up in Minnesota a season ago. You know that this is a player that you're going to face at least two times a year for the foreseeable future you have to have a plan against that. And not only do you have to have a plan, you have to have a plan A, a plan B, a plan C, a plan D, etc. And you have to throw the kitchen sink at him and you've got to throw different coverages, which they did a little bit of, but you just have to have a far better plan to take away Justin Jefferson. You can't let that guy beat you over and over and over again and really be the reason that you lose the game. I thought that was... Um, not acceptable from the coaches. They, they had to have a better plan. They didn't and it cost them. 
And while we all would have liked to have seen Jair Alexander a little bit more on Jefferson, and we've discussed that already, listen, the, I think the zone for the most part would have been fine, but they clearly knew that they were going into that game playing a ton of zone defense and they played a lot of cover four. They played a lot of cover four in that game. If that's going to be the case, and I know they've got a lot of veterans back there, right? You've got Jair Alexander, Razul Douglas, Adrian Amos, Darnell Savage, and then even Eric Stokes at least is in year two, right? It's not like he's a rookie. Keyshawn Nixon's an experienced NFL player. He only played one snap, but they have experience on that defensive backfield. You would expect the communication to be better. But if you're going to play that much cover four and just zone defense in your first game, you had better make sure that everyone is completely on the same page with the coverage rules and you know exactly how to pass off everything. And listen, I'm not saying the coaching staff didn't go over this stuff because I've seen it in practice, not this past week, but in training camp, they go over this stuff all the time, how to pass off coverages, exactly what to do in those situations. And I can't, I, I don't know what they worked on last week. You know, nobody in the media is allowed in the, the team activity. So I can't tell you how much time they spent on this, but it clearly wasn't enough because there were far too many breakdowns. And to me, there is still like, that's coaching. Like you've got to make sure that those guys know the rules, know when to pass, know when to stay and exactly what everyone's supposed to do in those situations. Minnesota attacked the crap out of Green Bay's rules and Green Bay wasn't up to the task. And that to me, again, is coaching. I would also like to see maybe this is more of a, a captain and, you know, player leader thing than a coaching thing, but there was the negativity. You could see it. It was, you know, tangible at times. And you just want to see specifically from an offensive standpoint, somehow you have to rally and just start picking up what you're doing offensively and just overall as a team, right? Yes, I get you're down three scores. I get it's not going great. I get your offensive line isn't protecting and it's going to be a grind to get back in the game. But you have the ball down 17 and you're going to get the ball in the second half. Like, this is not an insurmountable deficit to come back from. And it just, there was far too much negativity, far too much complaining, far too much all of it from too many people, um, specifically the quarterback, obviously. And that stuff I don't think is productive. And I think they've got to find a way to when things go wrong, they handle adversity better. And that ultimately is captains, coaching, and all of it combined. You would have loved to have seen Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon get more touches. They were successful. And I think when they were, especially AJ Dillon, when he got rolling, keep feeding them the ball. You don't have to try to outsmart the coaches and be like, all right, they think, you know, they know that we know that they know that we know that we're going to run again with AJ Dillon because he's going well. So guess what? We're going to do the opposite in this situation. No, just keep feeding the, the guy that's going really well that the defense can't stop. Once they stop it, all right, find a different plan. But if AJ Dillon's going well, like get him the football. That should not be the most difficult thing in the world. And I, I talked to this, uh, I talked to Aaron Negler about this as well, but this has been a tendency as well for both Matt LaFleur and Aaron Rodgers. When they get down double digits, even when they're down a touchdown, but specifically when they get down double digits, you can see that there is this tendency that they want to get those points back now. There's no patience. Like their patience goes completely out the window. And it's the exact opposite of what you should be doing in that situation. In those situations, they're going to play two safeties deep. They're not going to allow you deep plays. Their corners are going to play deeper than the deep, especially in man and in um, you know cover four, cover three, etc. They're going to play deeper than you. Make sure that they don't get over the top. They're going to keep everything in front of them, and it's going to you know test you and try you to stay patient even when you're losing because they're not going to allow the, the shot plays. They don't care if you're faking a play action. They're up 17 freaking points. If you run the football, you're doing them a favor. So they're not going to bite on your play action fakes. Go ahead, run the football. What do they care? Like they're not concerned about that. They're making sure that you're not going to get a 75 yard touchdown at some point when they're up by that many points. So th there's this tendency, it seems like there were so many shot plays and play act. Like there's the one play action and what Kendricks just comes shooting through the line. Like they're not buying your play action fakes at that point. You have to have a better plan for like just spreading out, going three, four wide and finding ways to attack their coverages, you know, with, you know, without all the smoke and mirrors, right? You've got to figure out that. And you, you can't just, you know, try to get, you can't try to get 17 points back in one play. It doesn't work. In fact, that's exactly what they're hoping you're going to do. 
that's like you almost are forced to have more patience. And it seems like Matt LaFleur and Aaron Rodgers have less patience in those situations. And I get you need to take some shots. I'm not complaining about that. Yes, there are times that you need to, you know, you need to try to take some shots and get back in the game. But if they're not giving it to you, you still have to take what the defense is giving to you and work your way down the field. You can go no huddle. You can do a variety of different things to pick up the pace and pick up the intensity. But if you're just like, hey, we're just going to take some shot plays down the field, it's not going to work. Like it has to be a bit more nuanced than that. So that's another thing is like, don't be on tilt. Don't get ahead of yourselves. Like you're, yes, you're down 17. Take it one play at a time, one drive at a time. It's coach speak, but like they almost need to listen to themselves sometimes in those situations. And then again, I talked about it yesterday. I'd like to see them learn from previous mistakes. Like we saw the same game basically in week one a year ago. Clearly, they're not going to make the same mistake twice, right? They did. It was the same thing. They weren't prepared. They weren't ready. They came out flat and it showed and they lost big. And I, I don't know. They just need to learn from those sort of mistakes. And sometimes that has been an issue for them. My three biggest takeaways and the three biggest issues, I should say, after rewatching everything, state of the offensive line, defensive back communication, and just overall like not living up in the moment or just the mental mistakes, right? The the Watson drop, the fourth and goal failure, the interception, the sack fumble, allowing the explosive plays, almost all of those had some form of mental mistake you know, involved with it and or just missed opportunity. And I think overall, these two teams were far closer, you know, matched up. And Minnesota made the big plays when they had the opportunity, and Green Bay didn't. And that was really the difference in the game. And it was a lot of mental mistakes from Green Bay. So offensive line play, brutal. Defensive communi- DB communication, brutal. And just way too many mental mistakes. That is going to do it for me today. Again, make sure to check out Packaday Live with myself, Ben Fennel, and Aaron Nagler, 7 p.m. Central Time today, right here on YouTube. I will be right back here tomorrow grading the pack, going over my grades for the offense and the defense. You can also check the full grades on Packer Report. Those will be up sometime on Tuesday. Not sure what time yet, probably in the afternoon, uh, but those will be up sometime on Tuesday. That does it for me today. Thanks for joining me. Always appreciate it. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.